Distinguished future physicians, welcome to Stop on Step 1, the only free video series that helps you study more efficiently by focusing on the highest yield material. In this video, I'm going to be covering alcohol metabolism, methanol poisoning, and the effects of either binge drinking or alcoholism. This is the second video in my series of six videos covering the biochem section. I encourage you to check out all the other ones when you are done with this video. We will start with alcohol metabolism, and you can see here at the top right corner, I give it a high yield rating of two. And for those of you who don't know what the high yield rating is, it's a scale from zero to 10, giving you a rough estimate for how important each topic is for step one. And if you want to learn more about that, you can go to my website here. Alcohol and metabolism. Obviously, you're gonna start with ethanol, which is just a fancy name for drinking alcohol. It's gonna be broken down by two different steps to give you acetate, and acetate is harmless byproduct. So this is why we can drink a certain amount of alcohol and be fine. Now this first enzyme in the pathway is called alcohol dehydrogenase, and it turns ethanol into acetaldehyde. The second step in the process is converting acetaldehyde to acetate using the enzyme acetaldehyde dehydrogenase. We will see in the pharmacokinetics section that alcohol dehydrogenase is an example of an enzyme with zero order elimination. That means it eliminates a constant amount of alcohol per hour or per any unit of time, regardless of how much we can consume. This is why it can take people a long time to sober up after drinking a whole bunch, because no matter how much you drink, this enzyme is still only taken care of a little bit out of a time. So when you drink a whole bunch of ethanol, you're going to have intoxication and other effects of having excess ethanol in your body. Depending on the situation, having those intoxication symptoms may actually be your goal. There are also other effects to drinking in excess, and this is partially due to the fact that alcohol dehydrogenase can work a little bit faster than acetaldehyde dehydrogenase. So what happens when you're drinking a ton of ethanol is you're sort of maxing out those two enzymes, and what happens is you end up getting acetaldehyde buildup. And acetaldehyde can create problems because when it's in excess, it causes some of the hangover symptoms that most of you are probably pretty familiar with. Obviously, hangovers and intoxication are not the only effects of alcohol, especially when you're drinking very frequently. Now, a lot of these other effects are related to NADH. And you can see here that both of these steps in alcohol metabolism create NADH. NADH is an electron transporter that you probably remember from your different biochem sections on glycolysis and gluconeogenesis and TCA cycle, all that kind of stuff. When NADH is present, it signals the liver cells that there is ample energy present. The increased amounts of NADH are going to signal a host of different changes in the body. The first being that you're going to have decreased glucose creation or decreased gluconeogenesis and increased glucose breakdown or increased glycolysis. This means you're not going to have a whole lot of sugar in the, in the body and that can lead to severe hypoglycemia or alcoholic hypoglycemia. And obviously the brain needs su sugar to function so when it's severe this can lead to a loss of consciousness. Another effect of having a high amount of NADH as a signal is that you're going to use up a lot of your pyruvate and convert that to lactate instead of using it to create energy or sugars. This means you're going to be going through a lot more anaerobic glycolysis than normal and you're going to end up with lots of lactic acid being produced. And lactic acidosis is a type of metabolic acidosis where you have low pH in the blood due to an excessive amount of lactic acid building up. Finally, the NADH signals will also lead to decreased fat breakdown or decreased fat oxidation and increased fat synthesis. This is most clearly seen in the liver where you're gonna see fatty change of the liver. And this fatty change can cause a bunch of other problems because as the fat accumulates in these liver cells, it's going to cause inflammation and that inflammation can damage the liver cells and lead to things like cirrhosis. The buildup of NADH is exacerbated if you're consuming large quantities of alcohol and not eating anything. 
if you're eating stuff with alcohol, you're at least going to offset some of those effects and decrease that NADH to NAD plus ratio. It can be a little tricky to remember the effects of alcohol consumption and the effects of NADH. So I, I created this little mnemonic, which I hope will help you remember these things as well. So first off, I just imagine a half full beer bottle. You can also think of it as a half empty beer bottle, depending on how pessimistic medical school has made you. And then I use each letter in half to remind me of what's going on here. So the H is going to be for hypoglycemia. A is going to be for acidosis. L reminds me where most of this is going on, the liver. And then F it stands for fatty change. It is important to be able to recognize the effects of alcoholism or the clinical presentation of alcoholism. And here are some of the most common things you can see as a result of frequent alcohol consumption. I'm going to talk about most of these items in more depth in the appropriate section related to whatever organ system it is. Right now, I'm just going to sort of mention these items and point out the association between them and alcoholism, which is pretty high yield. Obviously, if people are frequently intoxicated, falls and other traumatic injuries are going to be more common. And esophageal tears can also end up as a result of frequent vomiting. Wernicke Korsakoff, or vitamin B1 deficiency, is also pretty common in alcoholics, as many of them don't consume a balanced diet. They're getting a lot of their calories just from alcohol, and alcohol does not have all the vitamins and minerals that you need. Pancreatitis is also common in alcoholics. Hepatitis and cirrhosis of the liver. Now, this is non-viral hepatitis, different than like hep A, hep B, things like that. This is just inflammation of the liver that I mentioned earlier was caused by that buildup of fat in the liver cells. And over a prolonged period of time, that inflammation can lead to cirrhosis and other problems. And finally, if pregnant women consume excessive amounts of alcohol, it can lead to fetal alcohol syndrome. Now, my histology skills leave much to be desired, but even I know what this picture is, so you probably should too. So anytime you see a whole bunch of big white circles like this, it's probably going to be fat. And that's what this is. This is just fat accumulation in the liver cells. And as I've mentioned, that leads to inflammation and sometimes even necrosis. And what that means is those cells are going to be breaking open and spilling out a lot of their contents. And that can help us diagnose problems with the liver because when you're going to spill out certain enzymes, we can detect those enzymes in the blood where they're usually not supposed to be. And usually what we're looking at is AST and ALT. And there's an important correlation to look at here because in viral hepatitis like hep A, hep B, hep C, you're going to have a higher level of ALT than AST. And when you have alcoholic hepatitis, you're going to have a higher AST than ALT. In both cases, both enzymes are elevated, but you're looking at which one is higher than the other. Usually you're going to have one is about twice as high as the other one. The way I remember this is think that the one with steatosis, which is just a fancy name for fatty change of the liver, so that's the alcoholic one. So the one with Steatosis has a higher AST, so S for steatosis and S for AST. Withdrawal from alcohol is something that also must be considered in your clinical presentations because it can be life-threatening if it's not recognized and handled correctly. Most often this is when a person who's a chronic alcoholic suddenly or abruptly stops drinking alcohol for whatever reason. A lot of times that can be because they're in the hospital for some other medical condition or a surgery, something like that. Most hospitals don't deliver mixed drinks with their pudding cups. So this person who's been in the hospital for a little while, all of a sudden is not getting any alcohol. So what happens is two, three, four days after they've been in the hospital, they start going through these withdrawal symptoms. More mild forms of withdrawal can just show up as agitation or aggression. But in severe cases of withdrawal, you can even see tremors, seizures, tachycardia, confusion, and psychosis. This more severe set of symptoms is referred to DTs or delirium tremens. And that name helps you remember some of the symptoms associated with it. So delirium is going to be the confusion and psychosis. 
and tremens kind of sounds like tremors, so that sort of gets you to tremors and seizures. The treatment for DTs is benzos, and I'll talk more about benzos in the pharmacology section. The best treatment for alcoholism is some sort of 12-step program like Alcoholics Anonymous. But in some patients, this isn't going to be enough, so you're also going to try to add a drug called disulfiram. Now, disulfiram inhibits the enzyme acetaldehyde dehydrogenase. This is the same enzyme that we talked about earlier. It's the second enzyme in this pathway of ethanol. So what happens when you inhibit acetaldehyde dehydrogenase is acetaldehyde builds up really quick, and those same hangover symptoms end up coming on a lot quicker. Somebody who used to be able to drink a whole 12-pack without getting sick now may get sick after taking only a couple sips. Essentially, you're trying to give the person a really bad hangover on purpose to dissuade them from drinking. However, this drug isn't always effective. It has a relatively low compliance rate, which would make sense. How often would you want to take a drug that really can only make you sick? Patients considering drinking can think ahead and just not take their drug for that day so they can avoid the consequences of drinking. Disulfiram intentionally gives people these hangover symptoms after alcohol consumption, but other drugs sort of accidentally have the same effect as a side effect. A lot of times this is described as having a disulfiram-like effect, and the most famous example of this would be metronidazole. So that's the one that's most important for knowing for step one. And when somebody's on one of these drugs, you want to make sure they're not going to drink because they're going to have these same really bad hangover effects. Now we can switch gears and talk about methanol and methanol poisoning. Methanol is a component of things like antifreeze, paint thinner, moonshine, certain types of fuel. And it's consumed accidentally more often than you might think. It can be consumed by kids who really don't know better. Or it could be consumed by adults who mistake it for alcohol because it sort of smells and looks similar to alcohol. And when you have methanol poisoning, it can lead to blindness, death, and a whole lot of other things. Here is the breakdown pathway for methanol. And this should look familiar because it is similar to the ethanol pathway. They each use alcohol dehydrogenase as the first enzyme in the pathway. So they use the exact same enzyme for the first step. Now the pathway for methanol converts methanol to formaldehyde. And that formaldehyde is what causes the problems. When somebody is identified as having methanol poisoning, what you want to try to do is prevent that formaldehyde from being created. Because methanol by itself doesn't really cause any problems. It's the formaldehyde that's the issue. One way we can prevent this formaldehyde from being created is a drug called famipazole. At least I think that's how you say it. But this drug inhibits alcohol dehydrogenase. So that means the methanol sticks around and it doesn't get converted to formaldehyde, which causes all the issues. Another option is to basically just get the patient drunk. Since methanol and ethanol are regular alcohol, use the same enzyme if you give them a bunch of alcohol that'll competitively inhibit methanol. They'll both be fighting to use the same enzyme. This means that a lot less methanol will be metabolized and you'll end up with a lot less formaldehyde. 